Are you ready to thrive? As a trauma therapist, author, yoga instructor, and healed human, I personally and professionally know what it means to live stuck in survival mode. I've learned a few things in my healing journey and my career that can help you transform into your best self. Join me, Rebecca Case, as I use neuroscience, psychology, spirituality, and personal experience to help you find the tools and techniques to thrive. Hey friends, welcome back to Thrive the Podcast. This is Rebecca Case, and today we're talking about why it's important to get uncomfortable. A couple of months ago, I was at my gym and I was working out on the treadmill and I I was kind of thinking about something that was feeling really challenging to me. And I was trying to figure out my way through it and I was noticing how uncomfortable I felt and kind of my mindset was was in this space of, I don't like this. I want this to change. I don't want to feel so, so much discomfort or so much stress or so much anxiety. And the gym is often a place for me where I go to work out some stuff, uh, either the gym or my yoga mat. I will get on the elliptical or lift some weights or get on my yoga mat and kind of be thinking about a problem, something I'm trying to solve or something is just really challenging me. And usually I have ahas there and I, I kind of have insights and I find my way forward. And this day at the gym proved to be no different, but the lesson came actually as I was walking out of the gym. So I was done with my workout. I was wrapping up and feeling a little disappointed that like, gosh, I don't feel like I got the aha I was looking for. I still just feel super stressed out. I don't know what to do about this problem. And as I was walking out, there is a quote wall at my gym and somebody updates it from time to time. And the quote that had been updated for that day was, growth and comfort cannot coexist. And I got like exactly what I was looking for with that quote. So let's just think about that again. Growth and comfort cannot coexist. If you want to grow, if you want to change, if you want to develop new habits, if you want to learn to set boundaries or learn to feel more peaceful or to be more patient or you want to find a new job or go back to school or start a new workout routine, whatever that is, is probably going to require that you get a little bit uncomfortable or a lot uncomfortable. Now, when we talk about growth and comfort, I'm not saying that all growth requires this extreme level of discomfort where we're really talking about a toxic level of stress. In the field of psychotherapy and counseling, we talk about a concept known as the window of tolerance. And the window of tolerance is kind of your optimal zone of being able to tolerate stress and, you know, all the shit that happens in life without being too shut down or too overwhelmed. And usually most of our growth is going to come when we're right on that edge of feeling like this is almost too much, but I can still tolerate it. That is the space where we are challenging our biology, where we're challenging our neurobiology, where we're building new neural networks, where we're changing our thought patterns, where we're learning new skills. That growth edge is your best friend when it comes to growing and transforming and living a kick-ass life. You are not going to transform by just sitting on the couch all weekend, binge watching TV. Now, do we need to do that sometimes? Uh, Yeah, sure, go for it. But if that is your kind of MO, probably not a lot of change is going to come there because you have no exposure to stimuli or to problems or to figuring out new habits if you're just staying in your comfort zone. So finding that window of tolerance and finding the edge of your window of tolerance is where transformation really occurs. In yoga, if you have practiced vinyasa, vinyasa tends to be kind of the one breath to one movement practice, the flow of yoga. 
Yoga teachers will also often say, you know, find your edge. Do not go past your edge because sometimes when we go past that edge is where we open ourselves up to injury. We can make some really huge mistakes in our life or we say things that we didn't mean to say or we pull a muscle, we blow out our back, whatever that may be. So if you go past that growth edge, if you go past that that edge of tolerance, that is where no longer perhaps that adversity or the challenge or the discomfort is actually serving you. It could be harming you. But if you dial it back too far and you're not challenging yourself enough, then nothing is going to change. So to change, you have to get out of that comfort zone. And I feel like we live in a society that is overly fixated on comfort and especially in the middle class and middle white class, I would say, you know, we are very focused on our comfort and that like comfort is our right and we always need to be comfortable. And that is not completely accurate or true. So we know from a neurobiological perspective, when we look at studies around post-traumatic growth, so post-traumatic growth is kind of a field of research that really speaks to that trauma can actually help us to grow into more resilient and adaptive human beings if we show up and do our work. And so staying in this space of comfort is going to prevent you from becoming more adaptive and more resilient. Comfort is absolutely a valuable self-care practice. I love comfort. Don't get me wrong. I love going to the spa. I love cozy bed sheets. I love my cozy critters. I like my comfy house. But if all you do is stay comfortable, then all you will have is comfort and you will never experience growth. Another way that I feel that our society is kind of overly fixated on comfort is in the presence of trigger warnings. So trigger warnings didn't used to be a thing, I would say probably over five years ago, but now trigger warnings are a regular practice in universities and on some podcasts and in lectures and in learning spaces and on social media. And while we can understand the intention of trigger warnings is to give people a heads up, to allow people to prepare themselves to hear or see something that could be potentially upsetting uh, or gruesome uh, or traumatic. Or if we are dealing with some heavy stuff ourselves and we're given a trigger warning of, hey, this episode contains information about sexual assault, for example, or suicide or something like that. And if we're feeling really personally tied up in that, the idea of trigger warnings is that we have the opportunity to consent, right? Maybe I'm going to skip this podcast or I'm not going to watch that video or I'm not going to listen to this, what have you. But in fact, the research doesn't actually support the usefulness of trigger warnings. Ooh, I went down this whole rabbit hole a little while ago and I thought that this was really fascinating. Now, I don't use trigger warnings on this podcast. And part of the reason is because of this research and Additionally, I'll get into this research in a moment, but trigger warnings essentially are allowing us to choose to avoid something that could be upsetting or disturbing to us, understandably so. And it is great to have consent. It's always feels good to us to be able to consent to, you know, am I going to listen to this? Am I going to see this? Am I choosing this? But when we talk about the word trigger, let's just start with the word trigger. Trigger is overused in our society as well. And that anything that feels uncomfortable to us, people will sometimes say, that is triggering to me. And triggers and discomfort are not one in the same thing. So when we talk about triggers, triggers really comes from the field of psychotherapy where we're talking about individuals who have unresolved trauma and experience something, a stimuli in their environment, whether that be a person or a smell or a song or even a feeling or a body sensation. And that stimuli activates memory networks of that unresolved trauma and causes our nervous system to kind of re-experience or relive that trauma. So triggers 
are kind of pretty substantial neurophysiological events. They're not the same as, I don't like that, that makes me uncomfortable, and so that's triggering. And we've gotten to this place where I feel like we flippantly use the word trigger and we say, anything is triggering if it causes me upset. And it's as if we put this value on it that if it causes me upset and makes me uncomfortable, then it is bad and you are doing something wrong to me. And I just feel that that is a really unhelpful paradigm, not only for us to heal our trauma, but it kind of puts us in this place where we're always trying to just keep each other comfortable. And again, going back to the whole purpose of this podcast is that growth and comfort cannot coexist. Avoidance is a hallmark of PTSD and unresolved trauma because triggers can be so viscerally and physically and mentally terrible to experience. You have a trigger and all of a sudden you're having a flashback. Your whole body is re-experiencing an aspect of the traumatic event. Of course, your neurobiology is going to try to avoid that kind of discomfort. And so therefore, we get into these habits of avoiding things that remind us of a trauma, remind us of a person, remind us of an experience. And that becomes a hallmark of PTSD. If you actually look at the DSM diagnosis of PTSD, avoidance of triggers is one of the symptoms. And I say all this with a deep understanding and compassion, personally and professionally, for of course you want to avoid that which hurts. It's kind of on a survival kind of perspective platform. Part of the way that you stay alive is avoiding things that cause you a lot of hurt and harm, right? Makes sense. But part of trauma work and healing from trauma going to therapy, whatever kind of work you're doing to heal your trauma requires you to find that edge of your window of tolerance. Because if you're always trying to avoid things that trigger you, that activate that yucky traumatic experience that happened, that experience will never have an opportunity to fully metabolize or integrate into your neurobiology to a point that those things don't trigger you anymore. So all therapy is triggering on some level, in little contained dosaged ways. I'm not saying that therapy and healing trauma should be, you know, this huge exposure kind of event where you feel totally flooded and outside of your window of tolerance. But if we're going to grow and integrate really terrible stuff that's happened to us, that's hijacking our neurobiology, that's triggering us and causing us to get stuck in these patterns of avoidance, you have to start exposing yourself to the content on some level in some little tiny ways, in doses. So in today's world, it seems that we are overusing the word trigger to describe anything that is uncomfortable, taking it outside of its true context, which is meant to describe a trauma response. We're using trigger to describe anything that feels uncomfortable or slightly stressful. And the harm of that is that it puts us into this place of trying to live a life free of quote unquote triggers, of stress, and of discomfort. And when we get fixated on living in this way, in this kind of box of comfort, we actually create a great more amount of suffering for ourselves. Because all of a sudden, we're avoiding things in our life or people or taking action, taking responsibility for ourselves, choosing to learn new ways of interacting with the world and our emotions and our mindset. We create an impasse for ourselves. Meaning, if we're always fixated on comfort, avoiding triggers, avoiding stress, you will never actually get to grow. Life is stressful. Life is uncomfortable. And so when we fixate on comfort and avoidance of discomfort, in a way, we are refusing to accept the reality of our human existence. That things will be hard, that bad stuff has happened, and there will probably be more bad things to happen. Watching the events of the world is sad, but also sometimes hopeful and exhilarating. 
And there's scary things that are happening, but there's also a lot of love and joy that there are bad people in the world, but there's also good people in the world. So if you cut yourself off from kind of one side of that spectrum, from I'm trying to avoid all the yuck and all the sadness and all the sorrow and all the pain and all the potential ways that I could be hurt, you will unintentionally also cut yourself off from all of the things that are good, from all of the love, from all of the joy. So if you get into a pattern of selectively avoiding, it's kind of assuming that you can read the future. Because let's say that you choose to avoid a family event, assuming that that family event is going to just be incredibly stressful and upsetting, and it's just going to be full of bad, terrible things. You are mind reading the future. And perhaps that is informed by the past. Maybe you've had a lot of those experiences at a family get together. But perhaps if you went to this next family get together, you would actually be pleasantly surprised that your cousin sat down and had a really meaningful conversation with you and rekindled a relationship. I don't know. Who knows? Right. But if we try and mind read and assume that thing is going to cause me pain and we avoid it, you cut yourself off from the possibility that maybe there's something beautiful and wonderful and something to gain from that experience. But you have to make yourself uncomfortable by going to the family thing to see if it's different in the first place. So let's get back to what I mentioned uh, minutes ago about trigger warnings. So I just want to read some research to y'all about this because I'm sure you've all been exposed to trigger warnings, right? You hear on a podcast like, heads up, this podcast is going to talk about or on a social media post or something like that. So trigger warnings are content warnings that alert us about potential content that could be upsetting, distressing, activate our trauma experiences, right? And advocates of trigger warnings claim that these warnings really help you to prepare yourself emotionally for what you may be about to view. It also gives you the opportunity to say, you know, I am going to choose not to watch this. I'm going to scroll past that, or I'm not going to listen to this episode, or, you know, maybe I choose to walk out of class. I don't know, whatever that may be. But Critics of trigger warnings actually argue that these warnings can contribute to a culture of avoidance that is at odds with evidence-based treatment practices and that these kinds of overabundance of trigger warnings can actually instill fear about upcoming content. So if I give you a trigger warning and you're like, this is going to be a really hard thing to listen to, do you get in your head and make it more of a big deal than it actually was? Where if you had listened to the episode or listened to what have you without the trigger warning, would you have had the same emotional reaction to it? So a body of psychological research has recently begun to empirically investigate these claims. We present the results of a meta-analysis of all empirical studies on the effects of these warnings. So this is a summary of a meta-analysis article. So an article essentially that took a whole bunch of studies and did an analysis on all of those studies about trigger warnings. And so here they're reporting some of their findings and their results. Overall, we found that warnings had no effect on effective responses, i.e. your emotions, to negative material or on educational outcomes. So what they're saying is that trigger warnings had absolutely no effect on lowering people's emotional reactions to negative material or and it also didn't influence educational outcomes. However, warnings reliably, so trigger warnings, reliably increased anticipatory affect. So that means anticipatory affect is that like, I'm anticipating that this is going to be terrible and stressful, right? So trigger warnings actually almost caused more stress in some ways. Findings on avoidance were mixed, suggesting that either warnings have no effect on engagement with materials. So while we say that trigger warnings give people the opportunity to avoid viewing something, the research actually shows is that when you have a trigger warning, you are no more likely to scroll past it or avoid watching or listening to the thing. And they increase engagement with negative material under specific circumstances. So in some circumstances, when you get a trigger warning, you are actually more likely to watch the video, listen to the thing, read the article, what have you. So this meta-analysis concluded that trigger warnings actually kind of do the total opposite of what they are intended to do. 
So another study found that participants who read trigger warnings typically felt a bit more anxiety before reading or viewing any potentially distressing content compared to those who were not forewarned. So that's saying that in this study, individuals who read, there's a trigger warning here, had more anxiety about reading that content compared to the people who didn't receive a heads up or a warning. Interesting. I will link these studies in the show notes so you can check them out. So the reason I talk about trigger warnings is one, I don't make trigger warnings on this podcast and this is the reason. And this completely goes into this idea of how do we get out of our comfort zone and what are the ways that we live in our comfort zone or we feel overly like clinging to our comfort zone. And trigger warnings are one of the ways that we do that. So to change we have to challenge ourselves to try new habits. And when we challenge ourselves, we're essentially getting our biology and our neurobiology, so our brain and our body, into the zone of trying something different. And when you try something different, it you know, doesn't always, but there's a lot of times it feels uncomfortable. It feels unfamiliar. Sometimes it might feel really, really hard. It could feel upsetting. But we push ourselves outside of our comfort zone because there is something on the other side that is so deliciously attractive that it's worth getting out of your comfort zone. So maybe, for example, you want to change the status of your relationships. You are maybe finding yourself stuck in a place where your relationships are kind of constantly unfulfilling for you. You struggle to set boundaries with people. There's a lot of drama. Maybe there's this particular person or a group who are just really eating away at your sanity. And so if you want to change those relationships, you have to try to set new boundaries. You have to try new things. You maybe have to tell people no. You maybe have to go out and try and find new friends. And part of the risk of getting out of your comfort zone is that just because you get out of your comfort zone, there is no guarantee that it is going to pay off the way you want it to, right? So for example, maybe you are seeking a new friend group. And so to do so, you have to put yourself outside of your comfort zone of maybe staying home or hanging out with the same people that you always hang out with who are just not really fulfilling you. And maybe you find a meetup group and you go hang out with some new people on this meetup group, hoping that you end up clicking. And maybe you go to that meetup group and it is a total bust. Maybe like two people show up and they're people who are like, we just really do not resonate together. And I did not find a new friend group. Bummer. So you walk away and you feel bummed, but that doesn't mean that putting in that effort and trying something new is all for loss. You still pushed yourself outside of your comfort zone, which means that you may be more likely to do it again until you find those new friends or that new group. It takes time often. Getting outside of your comfort zone is not an immediate payoff. You do it because it pays off usually mid to long term in gains. Let's say also that you are wanting to, uh, let's go back to trauma. You want to heal your trauma, right? Going to therapy, journaling about your trauma, setting boundaries with people who are maybe the perpetrators of your trauma, whatever that is, you know, choosing to not avoid your trauma by popping pills or drinking too much wine or numbing yourself out in whatever way that is. Again, totally normal. People do it. I've done it. I'm not saying this with shame. But if we're going to change those habits and ways of being in efforts to heal, you're going to have to feel the feelings and you're going to have to be with the memories You're going to have to work through those messy, messy thoughts that trauma can cause us. And you're going to have to give your body the resources it needs to heal. It takes work and it takes effort. But when you push yourself outside of your comfort zone and you think, gosh, I really don't want to be outside of my comfort zone right now. One of the ways that you can keep yourself motivated is if you focus on the why. If you only focus on why you stay in your comfort zone, then you're looking at the wrong why and you're probably just going to want to stay in that comfort zone. But instead, focus on why am I getting out of my comfort zone? What am I after? And if it is incredibly attractive, if it is something that lights you up, that feels just oh my gosh, I want that so bad. You yearn, you long for it. You will be motivated to get your butt out of the comfort zone. 
So a quote that I love on this topic is that a ship in the harbor is safe, but great ships were not built to stay in the harbor. And so if you want to thrive and live a kick-ass life, you're going to have to get out of the comfort zone. And as you think about the Thrive Five, the Thrive Five being those five domains that when we focus on cultivating positive lifestyle habits, collectively allow us to thrive. So when we think about how we take care of our physical health, our emotional health, our mindset health, our relationships, and our spiritual practices and beliefs, think about which one of those domains you are clinging to comfort in. And which one of those domains are you going to need to challenge yourself to get outside of your comfort zone if you want to live that kick-ass life that you have been dreaming of for so long? Maybe that means I have to start getting to the gym. I need to start walking or I need to start running or I need to do something for myself physically and get my butt to the gym. And I don't want to go to the gym. I just kind of want to sit on the couch and eat Oreos and I would rather sleep in and I don't want to get on the treadmill. You know what? Anytime I go to the gym and I go and I'm like, I don't want to go to the gym. I promise you I walk out and I never regret it. If that means I need to go to therapy, I don't really want to go to therapy. I don't want to work through my anxiety or my fear or my grief. If what is on the other side of therapy, what you're going to therapy for is so attractive and delicious, focus on that more so than why you don't want to do it. You were made for great things and you deserve to thrive and you can absolutely thrive, but you're going to have to get out of the comfort zone to do it. So think about that window of tolerance concept, find your growth edge and start flirting with it. Remember that avoidance and staying comfortable isn't what makes people thrive or live a kick-ass life. Take care. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Thrive the Podcast. I hope these insights inspire positive changes in your life. If you're ready to take the next step in your Thrive journey, check out goodies linked in the show notes and on my website, rebeccacase.com. Sign up for my newsletter and get access to helpful resources, connect with my community, and be the first to know about events and happenings. Remember, your journey from surviving to thriving is unique, and you have the power to create your best life. Subscribe, share, and thrive into your potential. Until next time, this is Rebecca Case, signing off. Thrive on! Thrive on!